Christine, welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Great to be here. Christine, I mean, God, I, I, I want to say I remember when this started, but then I was looking back at, at, uh, at some of the, the data and then I was thinking, no, Christine was working on this long before we were. <laughs> we talked about it. And, and so give it, you know, for the, for the listeners who, who want to understand Evidation or maybe the, the predecessor to Evidation, because give us the thumbnail on, on our biography of the company. It, it is true. We've been at this for, for a little longer than, than maybe folks understand or know. Uh, but Evidation actually started with a company that uh, myself and three other co-founders started called the Activity Exchange. It was a rock health company. And the premise of that company was uh, we had all come out of behavior-based advertising. Like that was our world prior to Evidation. So uh, we were uh, trying to understand how behaviors in the real world might influence people's purchasing behavior or more specifically their clicking behavior on a mobile phone. You've got this mobile phone with all these sensors, specifically location data. We ought to be able to tell you um, whether you're a frequent business traveler or not. We ought to be able to understand whether you're a weekend getaway person or not and be able to hit you with an ad kind of at the right time. Um, and so uh, separate from demographics, uh, we were doing behavior targeting and some of the brightest minds were doing that. Uh, my co-founders at my last company were the head of uh, MIT Human Dynamics Research, um, the head of Columbia's Machine Learning Lab, et cetera. Um, and some of the brightest minds were focused on this. And you know, it, it works. Um, if you look at a person's behaviors, you can definitely do a better job of influencing their future behavior. But what a shame that we were taking all of this brain power and compute power at the time and applying it to advertising. And when we, uh, when we um, uh, exited that company, we looked to healthcare as a way to, you know, really put the technology forces to good. And this is the idealistic story that lots of tech founders come to healthcare with is, hey, we we're doing this stuff in tech and now we're going to save the world and go to healthcare. The reality <laughs> of that idealistic view is, you know, it's really idealistic, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> and you quickly realize that healthcare um, is actually very twisty and complex and you know nothing. <laughs> you literally, you might think as a tech person, you know a lot and you know nothing. Uh, and so along the way, um, one of the first things that we did uh, was we actually uh, realized nobody was collecting a lot of this data um, and doing it in sort of a privacy sensitive and consent focused way. Uh, and so we set up an app called Achievement and we began collecting this data really for the purpose of experimentation, uh, really for the purpose of collecting all of this new at the time Fitbit was kind of brand new and getting started. There really wasn't an Apple Watch mm -hmm. yet, et cetera. Um, and so could we collect this data and understand anything at all? And it turns out you could, which is great, but then we had no idea what to do with that as a team. Um, and so we met you, Harry, uh, and Rowan <laughs> Chapman over at GE Ventures. Uh, and we met Deb Kilpatrick uh, at GE Ventures as well. I think she was um, someone who uh, had a long relationship with you and Rowan. Um, and we joined forces with a company that you and Rowan were starting at GE Ventures to form Evidation. Um, and it's been, you know, it's been fantastic ever since because we came from this background of tech and behavior-based uh, targeting and large scale compute and AI. And you guys and Deb came from guys, 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 this is a healthcare industry. It works really differently <laughs> over here. You have no idea what you're doing. You actually have no idea the value of what you're building if it's pointed in the right direction. And that the, the, those two viewpoints are what really combined to give Evidation, I think it's superpower, um, which is we have uh, built an entire system and a population to measure health in everyday life. Uh, in the beginning of our journey, these measures are really aimed at understanding um, therapy effectiveness in the wilds. Uh, but I think as we look to 2020, as our company looks to 2021 and forward, and we foreshadowed this a bit in our last financing, these measures to really make impact need to be applied in a delivery or care delivery setting. And so that's what you'll see more of our company talking about next year and forward. How do we engage individuals and motivate action based off of a lot of our work that we've done to understand therapy effectiveness in the wild, 
but how do we do that in a delivery setting versus just a study setting or research setting in which we do it today? Yeah, I mean, it's it's if I think about like, and I, I remember like the first few days where there was a lot of whiteboarding going on. I mean, super <laughs> exciting time. I mean, we were thinking about all sorts of stuff. It was great. Um, and uh, I, I sort of miss those days every once in a while. I, I love totally the miss days those days, right? <laughs> yeah, um, so much potential. Uh, you're so much potential and we didn't have to make it work right then we were coming up with <laughs> ideas which is always good right ideas are wonderful um but i feel like also that you know the company has evolved i mean it's had to like you know it, we've learned a we've few things and um and and so you know where do you think it's gone from where it started to where it is today where do you think those you know some of the learnings maybe. You know, I, I look at the news clippings from that series A we did with GE Ventures and the news clippings are all about, we're gonna validate digital health solutions, um, which was a great way to get started to build some of the infrastructure of the company, but that was clearly not the money shot. That was clearly not where we were going to have massive impact on the world. Uh, and one of the first Weave and Bob that we did really was, um, we were connected with the biopharma industry through our prior lives uh, and a top global biopharma came to us and said, hey, you guys are collecting all of this information in a consented way. You're studying it. You're understanding like how people are, are um, reacting to things uh, in, in, in the wild, so to speak, or in the re real world. We really need that. We really want to understand whether our therapies are solving a true patient need or not. We really wanna understand whether people are on the right therapies in a faster cycle than we do today, because what we do today is all driven off of things like claims data, is all driven off right. of you know super long delay, really messy data, not always accurate you know, outcome data. Uh, and we wanna put a finer point to understand, no, 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 what's happening with that patient in, in real world settings, not in sort of clinical real world settings. Um, and so our first weave and bob was to focus on biopharma. Now the entire, like everyone was trying to get us to go employers and payers and things like that. Um, and we, we went completely the other direction. We said, no, 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 biopharma is where it's at. Um, and so we made a bet on that and that bet has turned out well for us. Uh, so that was our first weave and bob and we started doing all these research studies uh, with biopharma and then you know our second bob our second act is really going to be uh how we apply those measures provide some of those measures back to individuals um and really motivate the next best action especially in conditions where it's not clear what to do next all right well, I remember when when uh, I'd come to visit you in Santa Barbara and we were talking about how the data showed, you know, different things. And I remember like, yeah, I was I, mean, I was ecstatic. I was like, ah, oh, we can do that. That's amazing. Uh, now, how do we do prove it? Do a trial, do, do a study it? like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, um, but it's always exciting to see that, you know, it, it, everything looks like it's going in a particular direction beyond anything that I think we imagined at the beginning, um, right. which is a great, great direction of a, of a, of a company. Um, but, you know, let's step back a second, right? You, you, you've been at this since, like you said, early Fitbit, right? Which I don't even know, those are now maybe in a museum somewhere, but um, <laughs> now we've got, you know, Apple Watch and, and, you know, that didn't come out till what, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's got functions like, CG and they're mm -hmm. constantly updating and VO2 max, which by the way, yep. I've got to get back to, you know, at scores. some point I got, it says that I'm below average for the last three or four days. So it means I got to get back to exercising, but, um, you know, what have been the biggest kind of challenges, uh, or changes for you with, you know, all these digital technologies, you know, evaluating them, employing them, putting them in place. I mean, it's not one data stream. It's, it's, a cacophony of things that are coming into evidation that you have to do i use it do i not use it does it make sense is it helpful um what works and what doesn't how, how do you guys think about that i think early early on um we encouraged so i think the hardest thing has been about uh obviously as the industry grows 
there's more and more noise in the industry about what's the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do. And people tend to hold on to these heuristics like, well, you can never use a consumer grade wearable you know, to understand therapy effectiveness or vice versa. You can never use a clinical grade wearable to you know, understand um, behaviors in real life. Like, so the, um, as the industry learns how to leverage these tools, uh, one of the biggest challenges is getting everyone to understand, look, let's pull out the use cases, prioritize them specifically, and then figure out the right tools, you know, to meet that need versus sort of these broad heuristics that um, are good sound bites, but not actually uh, very helpful. Um, and so along the way, we've had to combat things like, well, you can't use an Apple Watch for understanding, you know, if whether people might be at risk for heart failure or not. And it turns out like, you know, yes, you can. You just have to know the right way to combine the data, the noisy data you might be getting from a consumer grade wearable uh, at the time with uh, the clinical data and clinical history and with patient reported outcomes in the moment. And when you combine all of these things, that's where you get power. That's where you get more sensitivity and specificity. But I think folks had been dogmatic in the early days about, no, we're just going to use the sensor data. And what Evidation has had to learn ourselves, but also tilt the industry towards is, no, 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 it's the combination of all these contexts that give you the most power and that there's real danger in just relying on one data stream in and of itself. Um, uh, and that implies like a lot about the future of where this is going. It implies a lot about all the components you need to have in place to do this well, um, that I think Evidation has put together really well, of course. Uh, but, you know, it's really combating these heuristics and opinions that get hardened and formed uh, by the industry before the industry really understands or knows what's possible or not. So that, that's actually, I found the biggest challenge. But, I mean, if I remember how the back end was designed, it, it in some, I, either by design or by luck or a little bit of both, but it was sort of yep. designed to do that from the beginning. From the get-go. And that was yep. not trivial um, no. <laughs> to, to create. And it's not trivial um, to maintain it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, also at the same time that you've been doing, you know, Evidation has been around, I mean, the whole space of, you know, artificial intelligence and, and all the tools and the, you know, advancements in hardware and cloud and everything is also sort of erupted at the same time. How mm -hmm. much is that, how much is that playing a role in sort of the advancement of the, of the company per se? I think uh, early on in the company, we thought we had to build everything ourselves. We thought the value of the company in fact uh, was tied to the technology of the company. Um, and this is actually kind of profound. The difference between are we selling a, a technology product and platform or are we selling something else? Um, and so in the early days of the company, you know, Harry, when you and I were talking, I think uh, you were pushing us on, guys, guys, you, you, you guys got to focus on the data asset. You got to focus on, you know, what you're learning from the data. Um, and I think our team had this bias of, no, no, no I think the technology platform is interesting. Now, uh, when um, it became really clear, really fast a few years ago that all the technology was gonna get hyper commoditized at a rate none of us could have predicted, that all of the ways to process streaming data, that all of the sort of um, backend data stores um, to chop through that data at a rapid pace um, and a fluid pace were going to get commoditized, that you know almost every component of the system of the technology platform was going to get commoditized by various vendors in hyper competition with each other. Google, AWS, you know, Azure, plus all the services that live on top of that are just, you know, it's, it's been astounding the rate of commoditization that has happened on the back end. There's still technology edge in being able to, you know, choose the right things, having the right requirements, right. Uh, designing the system, stitching all this stuff together in concert so it all works, especially uh, when a big pharma company or the FDA comes to audit you. <laughs> so yes, all of that yes. is still a big technology and process challenge. Uh, but we didn't have to be experts at designing like the 
the code base that streams the data efficiently. Um, and that's right. something that we wouldn't have predicted, I think, back when we knew you uh, and were forming this company um, versus today. It's very, very clear that's not the core of our value to the industry. And it's interesting because I'm not seeing that part of it slow down depending on oh, where you're talking about. Yeah, it's just, it's honestly, it's accelerating. Um, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's, that's an interesting, as an investor, it's, it, it, depending on who I'm talking to, they either get it or they don't get it, right? And so it's an interesting mm -hmm. conversation that I'm always having with people. Yeah, um, now it's, it, it's alarming when I meet a company and they're like, yeah, we've custom built like everything. And I'm just like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know, unless unless that custom built thing is actually your business. If you're going to go compete with Snowflake, <laughs> you know, uh, then, right. you know, I, I don't know. That's a little scary to me. So so now it sounds like, especially based on a lot of the studies, it's predicting health outcomes is the direction that the company is taking. Is that mm -hmm. a fair assessment? We, we want to do... You know, we want to do more than predict, Harry. Uh, we we want to make, <laughs> we want to we want to try and influence the outcome. Uh, but um, I think I've I've always thought and kind of said that uh, in order to in order to help make the outcome, you have to be able to predict the outcome. Um, so uh, we have to we we've had to start with predicting the outcome, and um, you know, not to split hairs on what prediction means, but sometimes in our world, prediction is just describing what's going on. Like you don't right. even have to be that far ahead of the curve. You just have to even, if you can even guess what's current for that individual, like, you know, where they are in their diagnostic journey uh, at that moment of time, you're already like 10 leaps ahead of the game. So Well, um, and if you look at where CMS is going, right? I mean, if it's, if we're, and I've been, you know, we've been talking about this for a while is fee for service. You really do want sick people because that's how you make your money. But mm -hmm. value-based payment, you want healthy people Yep. Yeah, you want to keep them healthy and you want them paying their insurance premiums. And so it looks like where you're going with it is exactly where the puck is going from a financial perspective. That's right. That's exactly right. And um, I, you know, I, uh, I know that um, sometimes in health tech, we think, every, you know, you go through enough logical steps, everything asymptotes towards, oh, now you're a payer. I don't think that's where evidation is going, <laughs> to be clear. I don't think evidation is ever going to be a a payer or necessarily take risk uh, on patients in a care setting. Uh, but I think we can enable a whole host of things on our platform uh, to help those uh, physicians or those companies who are going to take risk, take better risk and influence that risk. Well, I mean, you know, I think we had at some point talked about like, once you know that a drug works, right, it's there's an adjudication process that can take take effect, right? You, you sort mm -hmm. of- That's right. Mm -hmm. Instead of it being a guess, which drives me nuts, right? Try this. Um, that, if it doesn't work, let's come back and we'll change a prescription or, right? Is having hard data, you can nip it in the bud much sooner. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I always think to myself, people actually, or most people, maybe not everybody, want to be healthy. They don't enjoy being sick. So if you can nudge them or at least make them aware of it, they may change their behavior. Not everybody is, but I think a lot of people will. Um, so uh, it's, it, I, I do miss being able to look at the data with you guys every once in a while though. Oh, totally. There's just, it's, yeah. it's fascinating. Um, but so, okay, let, let, let's talk about some, um, some examples, like you guys are doing this multi-year collaboration with Eli Lilly, um, studying the data from glucose monitors and insulin pumps and looking for digital biomarkers um, mm -hmm. and and of how diabetes patients are doing and so So, you know, where are you in that whole process? I mean, um, I don't know exactly what Eli Lilly is doing versus what you guys are doing um, and how you know, the two, the two entities sort of work together or that you found the golden biomarkers that, that, uh, you know, you really want to focus on, but where, where, are, where, if that's a good example to use. Um, yeah. I'll, maybe I'll talk more broadly about a couple other examples too. 
Um, so one of the one of the actual first collaborations that we did with Eli Lilly was with Eli Lilly and Apple on a study in Alzheimer's disease, really trying to understand could we use this massive digital data to understand the early signals of cognitive decline, which given you know all the recent news about Alzheimer's, um, it's no uh, it's no wonder that companies are chasing a way to identify these earliest stages of cognitive decline in a very sensitive way because you know uh, all the therapies pretty much only work if they get there before the plaque gets there versus right. after the plaque gets there and builds up. Um, so it's incredibly important to find these sensitive, you know, these early signals. It's also incredibly, um, uh, it's incredibly important to get to highly sensitive measures versus what all characterize as the crude measures for measuring cognitive decline today. So if you look at like every study of cognitive decline, there are a few biomarkers. Uh, there's PET scan, tau PET scans, um, mm -hmm. there's uh, cognition tests that are administered by a clinician. And if you look at some of these cognition tests, they're, they're actually pretty crude instruments versus Harry, if I had all of your like digital interaction data for years, I could start to see in a very sensitive way uh, where your cognition was slowing. I could get incredibly sensitive if I have your voice recordings over right. a longitude of time. I could get incredibly sensitive if I had, you know, the number of times that you I uh, had to ask for your password again, et cetera. Like just way more sensitive than what a cognition test is going to be as a, a slightly more crude measure. In addition, now I can get to the, the uh, holy grail of medicine, which is N of one. Now I can get, if I have several years of your interaction data like this, I can literally compare you against yourself versus again, the crude way we do it today, which is you get thrown in a bucket of people, everybody gets a score out of this cognition test and you're just compared to the mean. Um, right. uh, which gosh, if you're, I don't know, a rocket scientist, you shouldn't be compared to the mean. You should be probably compared to other rocket scientists or even better, you should just be compared to yourself over time. So that's what we're trying to get to in cognition. And so the work was sort of kickstarted with Eli Lilly and Apple. And there's a bunch of other work with a bunch of other players that are going on. And Evidation's really grateful to be involved in, in a bunch of other things to further that score. But you can see where the promise of something like this unfolds very quickly. A, we identify people more passively, which means we can do it over many years because it takes hardly any effort from you. It just takes like your everyday behavior. B, uh, if we can catch that signal early, then we can actually potentially do something about it. We'll see what happens with, you know, the Biogen drug. We'll see what happens to other right. drugs like it. And see for those drugs that might be stuck in pipeline or stuck in development because there aren't sensitive enough measures to understand their improvement, we can get those past two. Does that make sense? Yeah, I remember, so, I, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. I've had Massive impact there. Yeah, I've had, I've had this conversation with, you know, some of the pharma companies who don't, everybody's do, everybody's responsible for a different data stream and it's yep. the coming together of the data streams. The second thing is and now using AI and ML to actually provide automated measurement of some of these brain scans and so forth also like will help drive this. I, I interviewed uh, Rhoda Al from uh, yeah. uh, Mass General on, on voice. And you know, it's funny when you talk to the, with some of my neuroscience uh, doctor friends is they're not buying it as much, mm -hmm. right? They, they're always hopeful, but they're not really buying where it can go. And you can see the, the power of this. And then I keep thinking to myself based on a lot of the stuff I'm reading about in other parts of machine learning and AI is, do you need as much data? As time goes on, do we need, do, do we need smaller data sets where we can sort of see changes or do we need continuous monitoring to see those changes? Um, hmm. That's where I, I see thought, sort of the next phase. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it along those two vectors, small versus continuous. I So I'm a big proponent of continue, like you, you don't need every day, like especially for voice, you don't need every day. Uh, by the way, there's a bunch of signal too in video. Um, so it's not just voice, but it's also video. Um, you don't, uh, you don't need high resolution continuity for all use cases. Um, 
and again, this is back to like, what, what's the problem we're trying to solve and then work backwards from that to see what you actually need. And things like voice and speech for cognition, I, I totally understand some of the skepticism around it. I'm a true believer, obviously, because I've seen some of the early data out of it. So I understand some of the, maybe the opportunity there a little bit better, uh, but I don't need your voice every day. I don't need your voice every conversation. I just need some samples over time. Um, right. And, uh, you know, and so again, it's sort of um, the, maybe one, one way to think of it is, yes, at some point predictive analytics will get great enough where you need fewer samples of things to draw a conclusion. That's true. For some use cases, you really want high resolution, high frequency, continuous data. For example, in heart failure patients to predict a heart attack, uh, you right. want high resolution, high frequency every day for a period of time, probably weeks, not years. But in something like cognition, you want years and you want sampled. Um, so right. yeah, I, I think it just mostly depends on the use case. I almost feel like during COVID, my cognitive functions have have slowed oh. down. <laughs> <laughs> like my my two year old is in a sleep regression. I can tell you, I'm bombing all of my cognition scores right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so this this you know evolution of evidation. So so what does success look like for evidation? Yeah, that that's a great question. That's maybe where the most uh, weaving bobbing has occurred at our company. I can tell you when we started the company. Harry, as like a bunch of tech idealists, um, success for us was uh, being, you know, um, uh, being on the back end of millions of people uh, to change their behaviors. Like, I think if, you know, you're an expert Googler, you could find some presentation of me talking about, look, success for evidation is uh, being able to change the behaviors of millions of people um, and, and figure out a way to quantify and improve an outcome. Um, so it was very mission driven and mission oriented and, and still is that that actually could still hold true for us. I think for success for us is if we are a core part of the system to help people understand their behaviors or individuals understand their behaviors and their care teams understand their behaviors in order to give them a more personalized care experience and improve an outcome, we would be super happy. We would be super happy if we're embedded in just a few systems to do that. We'd be even more happy if we were sort of the global system of record for it. So right now you've got various customers. And I remember like when the first press release came out, I remember a deluge of people knocking on the door. So I don't think that's changed. <laughs> but but right now for your typical customer, collaborator, I, you know, however you frame it at the company is, um, how do you work with them? How do you help them? How do you, you know, how do you make money by what you're doing, right? Because we're talking about the big picture. And so what, what are the brass tacks if someone was Super interested easy. in? Super today, easy. Today, most people engage with us on studies. So they have a question, a hypothesis about um, behaviors in real world settings and uh, the effectiveness of their thing, I'll call it, whether that's a diagnostic test, whether that's a therapy, whether that's a, um, a digital therapy of some sort. So they have a thing uh, and they're trying to understand whether their thing makes a difference in a person's real life, not in their sort of clinical claims life. Uh, and so the easiest way to engage with evidation when you're trying to solve that problem or answer that question is a study. Uh, and so we, uh, in, in many ways, are almost like a digital site in CRO where uh, a lot of our studies happen on our own population. Um, and we can do them rapidly, we can do them efficiently, uh, and we have a claim to fame of being able to generate some of the highest quality data out of the cohort of folks um, and being pretty full service about it at the end of the day. Like you don't have to go out and contract with like 50 different people to run your study. In a lot of cases, we were already partnered with the right folks. We already have all the pipes for all the data that you need to collect, et cetera. Um, and so, the vast majority of people who uh, come knocking on our door have a hypothesis and have a study to run on our population and with us. Uh, there's another part of our business where we're licensing our technology platform out um, and we're partnered with folks on the operating model for larger types of project products. 
Examples of those um, services and products are things like the Heartline study with Apple and J&J, &J. Mm -hmm. things like uh, the Lumi Health Program in the Singapore government with Apple in the Singapore government. Uh, and there's a couple others that you know we're confidential about, but that'll be launched uh, pretty soon and, and sort of talked about pretty soon. Excellent. So that that and you know it, it, you mentioned Apple a lot, so they they seem to be spending quite a bit of money trying to understand their products as well as the impact that they have on patients. Yeah, we we talk about Apple a lot partially because they uh, uh, are we're public with a lot of the work there. Uh, we do work with other technology providers too, or technology companies too, but we're pretty they're pretty public, oddly because <laughs> they're not usually, but we're we're. Um, we're definitely announced as public partners of theirs and a couple different of their initiatives. The other thing that um, we we love about Apple is there's this unified vision or this aligned vision on privacy related to all these things. You can imagine, Harry, if I can start telling you whether you're cognitively declined before you know it, before your loved ones know it, before anyone else knows it, that's pretty sensitive information. That's information you don't want your employer to know. That's information you don't want your payer to know. Um, and uh, Apple, I think more so than any other tech company, is very aligned with us about the uh, the risk and value of that um, and how to treat people in that interaction in a sensitive way and how to push the envelope on making sure that that uh, data is extremely private to you and controlled by you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer. I mean, it's funny because I, you know, a lot of people will argue with me about Apple, it's just a privacy policy. I'm like, mm, yeah, but nope. it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's yeah. way more than that. Right. So, um, you Absolutely. know, people don't understand the, you know, I remember when you and I were talking about core iOS and, yep. you know, e even my, my patents in location-based services, I mean, <laughs> the amount of detail that you understand about a person is insane. If people actually understood what we understood. Um, that's yeah, why we, most we, of my stuff is off. <laughs> we know, we know, uh, at that level, you could know more about a person than they know about themselves. Uh, oh, absolutely. and yeah, and so, and so that's both, uh, exciting, but also there's a risk to that. Um, and I know tech is famous for tech people are famous for move fast and break things. Um, and we are not. <laughs> We're move fast and be extremely careful about not breaking things as it as it especially as it relates to privacy. Well, I think we've gotten to a point now. I'm hoping that that mindset changes. I mean, some of the tools that have emerged of how you can look at data, how you can see patterns in data, how you can. You break something today, it has a much more profound effect than, say, the thing you broke 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. at least from what I can see, from what you can do with it. Um, so I don't know of any, but do you, do you have any competitors in the space that I know of? I, I don't yeah, can't think I, of any really. If I step back from, uh, so if I think about it from a vision perspective, um, our ideal, uh, our ideal feel and look is we're kind of a learning system um, where people can put a lot of their tools and services to help uh, individuals navigate the system. Um, uh, they can put those in, test and learn, um, and apply the ones that work, especially in a personalized way. Uh, and you know, the folks who have the closest to that vision and a lot more money than us, uh, we are definitely the underdogs in the stories, verily. Um, they're, they've got that vision, they're executing it in a different way, they're probably executing it at a different scale in terms of billions of dollars in evidation. We're the, um, I would say, the scrappy uh, underdog, uh, but uh, have done and accomplished a lot uh, <laughs> given uh, relative resources. Um, and I think we uh, potentially push each other, um, you know, to help realize this vision much faster. So uh, in terms of longer term vision, uh, I would say, Look, uh, we want we want them to win. We also want to win, uh, and I think we'll both end up winning in this uh, if if everything goes well. But we we think about them a lot. Um, I think on a micro scale, you know, there are a bunch of folks who are sort of uh, doing parts of the system. I'll call it like uh, there are folks who have sort of study software um, right. where you know they have a cool Wizmajig where you can just start to throw. 
up like a study process and have an app, uh, you know, uh, in short order. And, and that's great. Um, but like I said, like the technology side of this is not the thing for us. Uh, that's that's right. not what we're focused on. We're focused on the population. We're focused on the methods for getting the data. We're focused on the data methodologies, et cetera, and consumer engagement. Um, so, so that's great. Maybe someday we'll use one of those. Uh, but, you know, people often conflate some of what folks are doing on that side of the house with what Evidation does, but that's just a component of what we do and not even the focus of what we do. Yeah, I do think, however, after meeting the guys in Santa Barbara and you, I think there's a magic of a, of the two coming together that really makes everything, Absolutely. Makes, yep. makes the flywheel turn. 100%. Um, you know, you're now the co-CEO. Um, what are the challenges? I mean, what do you, what keeps you up at night other than the, you know, your children? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my two-year-old. <laughs> who does that a lot lately. Uh, uh, what keeps me up at night? Um, you know, uh, one of the, I think one of the, one of the tough things uh, when you're growing a company like this uh, is, you know, um, I see some of my friends running sort of Silicon Valley breakout companies where they're scaling from zero to like thousands of employees, it feels like within a year. Um, they're just on this sort of exponential growth trajectory. And that's, I'm sure, hard in its own way. Uh, but they're skipping the messy middle. Uh, and Evidation has grown in a way where we haven't been able to skip the messy middle in a way. We felt the messy middle. And this is emblematic of, I think, lots of our peer set in the health tech space. Um, you look at you know some of the the best health tech companies out there. And we've all grown this way where we're not allowed to skip the messy middle. We feel it. <laughs> and so what yeah. keeps me up at night is constantly reevaluating my own skill set to see if I still fit, <laughs> you know, uh, to see if I'm still the right person to lead the next phase of the company. Uh, because you actually have to be very good at the next phase of the company uh, in order to lead it because we spend time in that next phase. We don't get to skip it. We don't just get to hire a thousand people and go, okay, we went from a small company to a gigantic company. So that's one thing that keeps me up at night is what I enjoy, personally enjoy doing, making sure that the company stays agile and innovative, uh, but then also knowing that there has to be a lot of organizational structure in place uh, because the next phase of growth requires it. Um, right. I think the other thing that keeps me up at night is just, um, look, I'm someone who, uh, who lives in the future and wants to make the future, wants to pull the future uh, to the present in a lot, a lot faster pace than I think most people are comfortable with. And I constantly worry about that. Like someone's going to beat us to the future. <laughs> and, um, and so I constantly worry about that. So, well, I wasn't going to ask this, but now that you open that door, it's like, I, I truly believe that, that COVID has pulled forward mm -hmm. the future um, in a way that if you and I were talking about it, I would, on some things, I'd be like, ah, that's another five years. That's another 10 years. But some of these items all of a sudden have become an imperative for providers and so forth. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're pulling the technology forward. And the fact that we've got another, I dare say, five or six months in this, you know, COVID dynamic, some of this, I think, is going to be permanent. Uh, and it's going to move evidation or, you know, evidation or companies like you forward faster. Do you, mm -hmm. you see it the same way or am I just spending too much time in this room by myself? No, I, I see it exactly the same way. There's this big wave uh, that happened this year um, that caused a lot of, you know, obvious destruction in society, um, but is forcing the adoption, the rapid adoption of a lot of what we've been talking about for years and it happened all of a sudden. So it's like being a surfer on this big wave and it's coming and all the other surfers are rushing out to the wave, by the way. And you're hoping not <laughs> yes. to get crushed by the wave and you're also hoping not to collide with all the thousands of other surfers who've now joined you on this wave you thought you had to yourself. <laughs> and you want to you want to survive that. You want to excel at it, survive it, get, you know, ride that wave um, all the way to the end of it. Um, and and so that's that's the trick now is this acceleration has happened. You're right, this massive change in the industry has happened, um, not by what anyone could have predicted, but consequently there's a lot of tailwind, but there's also a lot of new competition and people sort of pivoting into the space. And so 
trying to distinguish yourself from that noise, being confident that you have the background, the experience, um, you know, to do it well, to ride that wave well, you know, and trying to dodge all the other surfers who are probably going to wipe out <laughs> is, yeah. is a trick, is a trick. Uh, I have faith. Uh, I, I, I know some of the team members and I have, I have lots of faith. So, uh, thanks for taking the time. It was great to catch up. Um, I can only wish Evidation the greatest success, right? Uh, <laughs> um, it's, 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 it's been fun to watch the evolution. Well, I appreciate the, the time this morning, Harry, and it's always so good to be with you. Thanks.